So I'm very excited to announce our next speaker, who's been here before, so I'm sure you'll recognize him. Dr. Sherry Mason, also known as Sam, earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Texas at Austin. She completed her doctorate in chemistry at the University of Montana as a NASA Earth System Science Scholar. While a professor of chemistry at SUNY Fredonia, her research group is among the first to study the prevalence and impact of plastic pollution within freshwater ecosystems. Among her accolades, Dr. Mason was named as an EPA environmental champion in 2016, was awarded for her excellence in environmental research by the Earth Month Network in 2017, and was selected to receive a Heinz Award in Public Policy in 2018. She has recently moved into a new role as a Sustainability Coordinator at Penn State Barron. Sam? Well, uh, thank you guys for sticking around. Um, I appreciate it. I'm kind of the close out. I'm going to think that they, they were saving the best for last, but then you, ha you started with the best. So that's all right. I don't mind being like second place. <laughs> um, I wanted to start off. I have been here before, and I wanted to start actually at the, at the end. The, this is the, the final slide that I usually present in my talks. Um, and I wanted to do so because of that little sticker down there. Um, and, and thank you guys. Um, Save the River, so the last time I presented here was 2014 and I had just lost my Manta Trawl, which is the net that I use in order to do the sampling I do um, in fresh uh, water bodies, um, fresh bodies of water. And um, you guys, after um, uh, I gave my talk, y'all raised $2,000 to, to help me buy my, a new net. And um, it really meant a lot to me. Um, so I really I wanted to take um, a moment here at the beginning and just really tell you um, thank you and, and how important and how much that, that it really it just it meant a lot to me uh, to have your, your support. Um, so thank you. Um, and now we'll start the talk, right? And I have just one word I want to say to you. Just one word. Plastics. <laughs> <laughs> you can't give a talk on plastics and not quote this movie, right? I mean, this is classic. Um, and in 1967, when this movie came out, it was actually a really some really good advice because at that point in time, we were only producing 25 million tons of this material. I say only. But that's because um, by 2012, that had increased up to 288 million tons of this material. And in 20, it's supposed to say 2015, <laughs> when the most recent statistics came out, that it increased up to 322 million tons of this material. Um, so it was actually really good advice for a young Dustin Hoffman <laughs> um, to get into. Um, where I want to start this, though, is exactly what is plastic, because I think a lot of us know what plastic is and that we interact with it constantly throughout our life, but many of us may not really kind of understand what it is from a material standpoint. Um, and I like to compare it, um, oh, okay, so it's a synthetic polymer. It's modeled off of naturally occurring polymers. These are things like our hair, our skin, our DNA. So there are naturally occurring polymers, but this is completely synthetic. It comes from fossil fuels as the starting material. Um, and I like to compare it, what a polymer is, to comparing it to a train, where a train is composed of individual cars that link together to make the overall train. In the same way, a polymer is comprised of monomers that are linked together to make the polymer, which is the plastic. Okay, so here I'm showing the production of polyethylene from ethylene monomers. Okay, um, and polyethylene is the most common type of plastic manufactured. It makes 50% of the market, and you find it as both high-density polyethylene and low-density polyethylene. 
Um, what makes this material so incredibly attractive is the fact that it is moldable, so you can make anything from a baby doll to buttons to a bottle of water, all from the same material. And there is no natural material that is as versatile because of its moldability as is plastic. Um, it's very lightweight, so then once you manufacture those materials or those products, shipping them is a lot more cost effective. And they're durable, so they don't break along the way, right? So you don't have to worry that that peanut butter in shipment, that container is going to break. And so it makes it really attractive from an industrial standpoint, right? The problem is, of course, is somewhat ironically, these same features that make it so attractive from an industrial standpoint are of what are concerned when it comes to the environment. They're very lightweight, so they get transmitted all over the planet, being carried by wind and water. So that as the polar ice caps are melting, melting literally trillions of tons of this material are being re-released into the environment. How did it end up in the polar ice caps? Well, it was moved there, right, um, and then becomes frozen. Um, it's very durable, and the reason why it's durable is because unlike natural materials, it doesn't biodegrade. So a paper bag sitting on the side of the road is quite unsightly, it's not aesthetically pleasing, but within 18 months that plastic bag would have completely mineralized. There are organisms in the soil that can use it as a food and it would return it back to the soil. It would take it all the way back to carbon, to nitrogen, to oxygen, to basic starting elements. That doesn't happen with plastics. With plastics, they instead undergo a process that's called photodegradation, where sunlight will act to make a plastic brittle, and then wind and water and mechanical actions will cause that plastic to break into smaller and smaller pieces. But even though the product is getting smaller and smaller, from a chemistry standpoint, it's still plastic. Very little is happening with those polymer chains, with those trains that we talked about at the very beginning. So from a chemistry standpoint, it's still plastic. The pieces are just getting smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where you go from having macroplastics to mesoplastics to microplastics to nanoplastics, things that are smaller than one micron in size, but it's still plastic still has all the same properties that a plastic has, has all the same chemicals that a plastic has. And that's what we'll come back to at the end of the talk today. Um, as a material, it was originally created basically at the dawn of the 20th century. Um, but it wasn't really until World War II that the infrastructure for the mass production of plastics took place. That infrastructure was part of the war movement. We used plastic for parachutes, for, for you know, uh, twine for, you know, thing, containers that we would ship things in. And when the war movement ended, we had all of this infrastructure in place. So business logically said, hmm, where else can we use this? And they turned their attention from the military to the consumer. And this is an iconic 1955 Time Life magazine ad, Throwaway Living, the subheading here disposable items cut down on household chores, right? <laughs> After all, why wash that plate when you can just throw it out? Why wash that cup when you can just throw it out? And this is used to really kind of demark this change in our society from one of conservation, from one of reusing materials to one of disposability, right? And we've bought into that. We have a society that's really built as a disposable society, right? Um, and that is what led to this exponential increase in plastics production, right? Um, <clears throat> the question is, I said, this material doesn't biodegrade, so where does it go? Um, about half of it each year ends up in a landfill, um, quote unquote, properly disposed of, right? Ten, less than 10% of it is recycled. That's going across all the different types of plastic because there's literally thousands of them and across all the different sectors. Um, there's many, many reasons why the recycling rate is so incredibly low and I hate to tell you but it's just going to get worse because China's not accepting our plastics anymore. So that number is not going to get any better. Um, and if we have time during the Q&A and y'all want to ask more about why the recycling rate is so low, I could literally spend an hour just talking to you guys about that. Um, 
But I want to move on because I want to talk about the fact that if you add these up, right, that accounts for at most 60%. Well, what about the other 40%? Where is that going? Now, I know y'all are not a scientific audience, but I'm hoping you can understand this. According to the EPA, it is unaccounted for. <laughs> Terribly scientific term there, I know. <laughs> Right? That's literally how the chapter ends in the, the waste report that they put out each year. It's just that it's not accounted for. We don't know. Certainly some of it each year is in continuous use, right? Like frequently I'm in places where we're sitting on plastic chairs, right? And those are generally reused for a couple of years before they're thrown out. We probably all drove here in cars that are plastic, the outside of them, right? And hopefully you keep your car for more than a year. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, there's still a lot of it, and current estimates are somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of the plastic that we manufacture every year are making their way into our waterways, right? Not really unaccounted for at all, except that we haven't been quantifying it. Um, and this is a topic of scientific research that really started in the world's oceans. Um, the first study actually came out in the North Atlantic Ocean, which we are very much connected to, right? Um, it was a, actually a study um, done in the Sargasso Sea that we were he hearing about earlier, <laughs> um, looking at zooplankton, phytoplankton levels, and they kept catching plastic. Um, and so they published about it. But, and that was in the 1970s, it was 1972. But you really don't see a lot of scientific studies talking about plastic pollution in the 70s and 80s until, 19, until the late 1990s. 1997, there was a study that came out by Captain Charles Moore looking in the North Pacific Ocean. Um, and because uh, he is a captain and unlike many scientists, he actually talks about the stuff he does in like the public. <laughs> um, and so he went on like, Today, the Today Show, and he went on all these news programs talking about all of the plastic that he was finding in what is now affectionately referred to as the North Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, and it's the largest collection of marine debris, but since then we've done studies and there are five gyres in the oceans and all of them have been shown to be mass collections of marine debris, 80% of which is plastic, 80% of which is not coming from shipping containers, right? And the whole like famous yellow ducky experiment, uh, shipping container came off in the middle of the, the Pacific Ocean. And lots of bath toys were released, but the yellow duckies were the most famous and they found them all over the world. Um, <laughs> Um, so most of that, 80% of what we're finding is not coming from shipping containers, it's coming from land. And that was, uh, came out in 2004, United Nations report, right? So most of that marine debris, most of the plastic is coming from us. And so the story we've been telling is that that plastic bag you see blowing in the wind makes its way into a river and that flows into a lake and all bodies of water eventually flow into the ocean. Right? So it's making its way through freshwater systems. As much as you hear about plastic pollution in the world's oceans, it's making its way to the oceans through freshwater systems. And we happen to live, as everybody is very well aware, <laughs> right, on the largest freshwater ecosystem in the entire world. Um, now, what was interesting to me, I'm originally from Texas. I moved here in 2001. <laughs> Sorry, somebody's out there for Texas. Um, <laughs> made me laugh. Um, so I moved here in 2001. 2011, though, was the first time that I ever actually went out on the Great Lakes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know. It was a crime. It was a crime. Um, and I went sailing. Um, and while I was out there, I thought about everything I'd heard, seen, and read about plastic pollution in the world's oceans. And I wondered if anybody had looked in the Great Lakes. And I, was, I came back and did a literature review, and there was nothing. Nobody had. So here's the largest freshwater ecosystem in the world where same plastic makes its way to the oceans through fresh water, and yet nobody had looked in the Great Lakes. Um, and so just because of that, right, <laughs> um, I, uh, I decided, let's do this. Um, and, and, and basically, it's changed my life. Um, so I'm going to kind of quickly report on some of the early studies, and then I'm going to flash forward to some of our more recent stuff. 
um, before I get to the end. So starting at the very beginning of the Great Lakes chain, we're already seeing, um, and this is averaging across Superior and Huron because we don't have very much data from either one of those lakes, we have already see those 7,000 pieces of plastic per square kilometer. Okay, very beginning of the Great Lakes chain, right? Lake Superior is like the least populated of the Great Lakes, though the most beautiful. <laughs> um, right, but we're already seeing 7,000 pieces of plastic. How much should we be seeing? None. Good job. <laughs> Good job, right? This is a non-natural material. There shouldn't be anything there. Um, as we've already been talking about, Lake Huron flows into Lake Michigan and vice versa, and that count in Lake Michigan goes up to 17,000 pieces of plastic, right? Second longest retention time of any of the Great Lakes, and so things tend to swirl there for a long time and allows for this accumulation. Uh, the water from Lake Huron flows into Lake Erie, and we see the count go up to 46,000 pieces of plastic per square kilometer. The most developed of the five Great Lakes, right? More people living in the, the Lake Erie watershed. So we see that count go up quite dramatically. What do you think is going to happen when we go to Lake Ontario? <laughs> Y'all don't want to know, do you? <laughs> um, and I should say that I included, we did go up the St. Lawrence Seaway, and I apologize that I, I, I can't show you that graph because we're working on the publication right now. Um, but this includes the St. Lawrence Seaway numbers, um, and the count goes up to a staggering <laughs> yeah, quarter of a million pieces of plastic per square kilometer. The highest count was right outside of Toronto, um, but the next two highest counts from the St. Lawrence Seaway. Okay, so um, extremely high counts. What, what really shocked us about this was not just the counts or the number of pieces of plastic that we see, but the sizes. Um, so here I'm showing you that we separate our plastics into three different size categories. We have um, our microplastics, things are a third to one millimeter in size, our mesoplastics, one to five, and my macroplastics, which are things that are bigger than five millimeters. Um, <clears throat> And what you see here is that the vast majority of what we pull out of the Great Lakes are less than one millimeter in size, okay? Um, and if we went to smaller sizes, it gets even higher, right? So the smaller you get, um, you just see more and more, okay? Um, people are starting, my lab, um, we're not sophisticated enough, but people are starting to look at nanoplastics, the counts are even higher. Right, because one piece that's five millimeters can make hundreds of pieces that are one millimeter, can make thousands of pieces that are half, right, and so on and so on. Um, to give you an idea um, of what these particles look like, we separate them into five different morphologies as well, kind of like shapes. Um, fragments are the most common types of plastic that we see. These are things that obviously broke off broke down from something that was bigger, right? Um, sometimes you might be able to tell what that is. Like this piece, it's a little hard to see here, but when you see it in person, you can see the edges, and it's a ring from like around a Coke bottle or a Gatorade bottle, it's a piece of that. Sometimes you can figure it out, but oftentimes you can't. I mean, I don't know if y'all can figure out what this came from, from any of those. You just literally can't kind of determine the origin, but it's obvious it broke down from something that was bigger. The next most common, at least at this point in time, um, when we did this work, were pellets. So these are round pieces of plastic, perfectly round, spherical balls of plastic. Bigger pellets are known as nurdles. They're pre-production plastics, and you often find them on beaches because of spills. They tend to be in that five millimeter category. They're bigger pellet sizes. What I'm showing you here, um, this is kind of my, probably my most well-known, well, maybe not since my most recent stuff, but initially this was some of my well-known work. You see these very small pieces of plastic, there, many of them are very colorful, right? And our question when we were getting these in the lab, we were like, where is this coming from? Because this didn't break down from something that was bigger. This was produced as a round spherical ball of plastic. Where is it coming from? So we did some detective work, and it led us to these products, right? Um, things that have microbeads in them, right, that are used as exfoliants, but you look at the ingredient list and you see that it's actually a oh, polyethylene. We were talking about that at the beginning, weren't we? Right? So it's actually plastic. Um, these were banned, right? In 2015, Obama signed the, the National uh, U.S. Microfeed Bee Water Act. 
um, was signed into to law, and that's what led to my Heinz Award um, this last year, was, was the work I did to, to pushing that plan uh, forward. Um, so hopefully we don't see these anymore. <laughs> um, enforcement is, of course, always the, the, the part of that, right? Um, <clears throat> the big topic in microplastics now are the third most common in this graph, and these are fibers. So these are things that broke off of your clothing when you were washing it, right? Um, and they go down, and I'm not going to show you. I originally had it in, but I realized I was going to go over time, and I'm probably still going to go over time because I like to talk. Um, <laughs> right? But we've shown that they make their way through wastewater treatment plants. And in fact, the majority of the microplastics we see coming out of wastewater treatment plants are these fibers. Um, and it's, there's a study, a really great study that was done um, at Plymouth University in, in the UK. Each article of synthetic clothing, when you wash it, at a minimum, at a minimum, releases 15,000 fibers. That was the smallest number that they found, and most of them were releasing more than that. Um, so these are becoming quickly the most prominent type of microplastic we see in the external environment and a lot more difficult to control than the microbeads were, right? Because you're not going to ban people from wearing fleece, right? <laughs> I'm not, because I think I would be like, you know, <laughs> people would come after me with, you know, pitchforks and, and fire and stuff. It'd be crazy. Um, so um, this, is, this is a really difficult one and kind of on the forefront of this work. Um, so that's my initial work. And now I want to flash forward. I'm going to skip over about a dozen studies that we've done since that initial work in 2012, 2013, 2014. Um, and I'm going to talk about our most recent work. Um, so as I've gotten involved in this, you know, I'm always trying to find ways to impress upon people the, the importance of this issue. Um, and so this was one of the studies that I came up with to do that. I was contacted by a student in, in Minnesota who's in the School of Public Health, and so she wanted to do a study on microplastics and public health. And um, we came up with this idea. Um, we, we started with the idea of looking at beer because the study had just come out looking at German beer and showing that it had microplastics. And I said, well, there's beer that's brewed using Great Lakes water. We know that there's plastic in the Great Lakes. I'm guessing there's probably plastic in beer and people, myself included, very passionate about beer, right? <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> um, as we were doing the beer study, a, a really interesting study came out of China looking at sea salt. And I was like, damn, why didn't I think of that? Okay, so we decided um, they, they went to grocery stores in China, looked at purchased sea salt, looked to see if it had microplastic, thought, let's do that here in America. Um, and then the real like new piece of it, so both of these are kind of repeat studies. Um, what I call Me Too studies before the Me Too movement started, and now it's just all complicated. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Not that kind of Me Too. <laughs> um, so uh, a real new piece of this was looking at tap water. So we wanted to look, you know, since I've been giving these talks, these public talks, I think even when I was here at Save the River last time, somebody asked me, is there plastic in my drinking water? And I've always been saying, oh, I don't think so. I don't think so. But it'd be interesting to know because that's what scientists do, right? We're like, yeah, I don't know. Is there plastic in our drinking water? So we decided to look at tap water. We started with this just being a United States study, and we were just going to get our friends to send us water. But then we met this really cool organization called Orb Media. They have global outreach, and so they managed to get us samples of tap water from across the globe. Um, and so it ended up being a global tap water study. So just an overview of the results, OK? So sea salt, this was all purchased in the United States. And what we found is an average of 212 particles of plastic per kilogram of sea salt. Now, kilogram is a lot of salt, OK? Um, obviously, we use these numbers so that we can compare to the other studies that have been coming out. Um, and I'll put this in perspective in just a second. Um, with beer, we looked at 12 different types of beer that were all brewed using Great Lakes water. We checked this out and we did uh, two from each of the Great Lakes and, and three from two of the Great Lakes. So 12 different beers using different Great Lakes water to use to brew the beer. Um, and what we found is an average of four pieces of plastic per liter of beer. 
And then the tap water study, like I said, it was a global tap water study, 159 samples collected across the globe, sent to our lab. We had no idea where they were coming from. That information was sent to a different location. And what we found in the tap water was an average of five and a half pieces of plastic per liter of tap water. So I think it's very important to point out beer is healthier for you <laughs> than tap water. Okay. Very important. I think wine is in that category too, just to say. <laughs> So I, I understand that these are really odd units for most of us. We're Americans. We don't use liters, right? <laughs> None of us, hopefully, is, is eating a kilogram of sea salt. So to, to put this into perspective, let's talk about in terms of yearly consumption. So if you use the maximum amount of sea salt that you're supposed to be, or salt that you're supposed to be using every day, 365 days in a year, you would be consuming 180 particles of plastic through just from your salt, okay? Um, if you drink, and you know, that's, that's using guidelines, right, based upon how much salt you should be ingesting, World Health Organization guidelines. Now, unfortunately, nobody tells you how much beer to drink. I really think that that's a problem and one that we need to solve. So, <laughs> so here we had to make an assumption. For some of us, maybe it was a bad assumption that you're only drinking one beer a day. I know, I know. I said it might have been a bad assumption. I'm just not trying to turn us all into alcoholics. <laughs> so if you drink one beer a day, you would be consuming 500, a little over 500 pieces of plastic just through your beer to go with your sea salt. I hope this is not your diet because it would be a really bad diet, by the way. Tap water, women consume a little, or World Health Organization guidelines, we're supposed to consume a little bit less tap water than men, and we assumed that we had a 50-50 population, so we just averaged it, okay? And what we found, if you go with how much water you should be drinking, you would be ingesting over 5,000 pieces of plastic just from your tap water, okay? So tap water is making the biggest contribution of plastic to your diet, if this is your entire diet. Okay. <laughs> to talk to the organizers. <laughs> All right. So this study came out in I want to say it was October of 2017, and I thought, oh my God, people are just going to be so shocked. They are going to demand change. You can't have plastic in our water. Get it out of our water. And you know what I heard instead? I think I'll just drink more bottled water what the f <laughs> what like this is how good their marketing is right that they have convinced us that if they wrap a product in plastic it will have less plastic oh my god <sighs> ah! <laughs> so my lab was was like we we're coming down, we we're about to go into the holidays, we we're putting things away, it was the end of the semester, and then I started hearing this, and you know what I did? I decided what better way to spend my Christmas break than studying bottled water. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and so that's what we did. We ramped up, um, we decided to collaborate with Orb Media again, who did a market assessment. Um, so that we looked at the top selling brands either within the world, so that would be things like Aquafina, Dasani, Nestle Pure Life. Those are the top selling brands worldwide. Or they were the top selling brands within a particular region. So for example, in China, the top selling bottled water is Wahaha. It's just fun to say. <laughs> um, and so within that region, we decided to test that bottle of wa the, that brand of bottled water. It was a total of 259 bottles that we tested. It was across 11 different brands. Some brands are bottled, for example, Nestle Pure Life in more than one location. Yeah, there it is in Lebanon. And so we tested it, both being bottled here in the United States and in other locations. Um, other locations, um, so Gerald Steiner is only bottled in Germany, and so that's the only place that it was sampled. Um, the, um, most often we would go, the whole thing was videotaped. 
every single step of the way because if you're going to take on the multi-billion, probably trillion dollar bottled water industry, you videotape every single thing you do, right? So we would go to a store, or somebody else would, and buy an entire case of bottled water. They would take it to a shipping location, ship it to our lab. We would open it, and the whole, we had a camera running for three and a half months in our lab 24-7, constantly running. So the whole thing, even when we weren't in the lab, was being videotaped to verify that we didn't like sneak in in the middle of the night and like taint samples or something, I don't know. Um, and um, most often we took of that case of bottled water, which generally is 24 bottles, we would do 10 of them, random selection of 10 of those bottles that we would test. Um, some of them are, are sold in bigger quantities, so two liters as opposed to 500 milliliters, and so we would do less of them. But the main reason it was the weird number of 259 bottles is because apparently when you ship in bottled water from Mexico, they don't think it's water. They don't think it's just water. <laughs> so in a case of 24, we were only left with nine after all of the testing because they kept thinking we were sneaking, I don't know, something else and whatever comes in from Mexico. <laughs> so anyway, that's the reason, 259 bottles. All right, what we found. Okay, so 93% of the individual bottles of water showed evidence of microplastic contamination. Every single brand. Every brand, okay? So, you know, every brand showed 100% of brands, 93% of the individual bottles, okay? <clears throat> in this study, we were able to go to a smaller size than we were able to in our tap water study. So looking at particles that are bigger than 100 microns, and if you want to know what 100 microns is, look at an individual strand of hair, that's 100 microns, okay? So pieces of plastic that are bigger <laughs> than that individual strand of your hair, we found an average of 10 and a half pieces of plastic. The same size, this is the size that we were able to go down to with our tap water study. Remember, we found five and a half. So twice as much plastic in bottled water as compared to tap water. Now, like I said, in the study, we were able to go to a smaller size range because science is constantly improving and changing, and we used a dye that allowed it to fluoresce. And so we went down to pieces, we could actually go down to six and a half microns. And looking at this smaller size fraction, we found an average of 314 pieces of plastic per liter of bottled water. Okay. <clears throat> it's important to note, these pieces are so incredibly small, they can actually make their way across your intestinal tract, be carried throughout your blood supply, and end up lodged in your organs, like your kidney, your liver. They can even make their way across the blood-brain barrier. All of this is shown. Okay, so this is established. So each liter of bottled water, you would be getting about 325 pieces of plastic in each liter of bottled water that you're drinking. Okay, um, <clears throat> but okay, so you know, it's in our water <laughs> and it's in our food. <laughs> and as somebody mentioned earlier, we're pooping it out. That's been shown, right? Um, so it's definitely in us. Why does this matter? Um, earlier, I said that plastic is a polymer. Well, that wasn't completely 100% true. That's the main component of a plastic. But in order to make a plastic moldable, we mix in plasticizers <clears throat> to keep it from breaking down while it's outside and in transit. We add UV stabilizers because we like to have plastic in every color of the rainbow. We add colorants. Because we're afraid it's going to spontaneously combust, we add flame retardants. Um, and then we put in other things too, just for fun. <laughs> no, other, they're also there for moldability and you know, different things. So plastic is not just that polymer. 
polymer is actually the, the thing that I'm not so much concerned about. It's all of those other chemicals. While those chemicals are mixed into the plastic, they're not chemically bound. Um, so things like phthalates, which are plasticizers, and bisphenol A, which you've probably heard about in the news, right? These are mixed into different types of plastic and they can leach out. And this has been well shown, this has been shown for BPA, that's why it was in the news, okay? As well as phthalates, we know that. While the plastic is in the water, it also picks up other chemicals, things like PCBs and polyaromatic hydrocarbons, because we know that these are legacy pollutants in the Great Lakes. And we find them stuck to our plastics that we pull out of the Great Lakes, right? So basically, each one of these pieces of plastic is like a little poison pill, and it's moving these chemicals from the external environment and into us. Right. Um, so we know in terms of these chemicals, we know that they're um, linked to increases in cancer rates, increases in autism, increases in obesity, and not just obesity like us, but in children under the age of six months. So this is like literally reprogramming our DNA. Okay. And for all the men in the room, in case those things aren't important to you, um, you're becoming less male intergenerationally. Um, so this is a GQ story that came out um, actually just this last year, um, <clears throat> talking about something that I've been talking about in public for quite a number of years. Um, <clears throat> men are, you're um, intergenerationally, penis size is getting smaller. Um, the distance between the anus and the scrotum is getting smaller, and sperm counts are all going down. And this is all linked to these, yeah. <laughs> Some of the guys in the room are like, <laughs> they're making very cute faces. Um, yeah, no, I mean, so this is like, this is serious, right? Um, so, um, yeah, so we know that this is happening, and all of these things have been linked to these, these endocrine disrupting chemicals that we know are in plastics and on plastics. So, what do we do about this? And I know I'm already over time, <laughs> but really quickly. Right. What I want you to picture is that you go home today and you find that you left your kitchen faucet on, and something is clogging the sink, and water is pouring out, and it's all over the floor. What's the first thing you're going to do? Turn off the tap. Okay. I like. I want to include this because the usually the first question I get is, well, how do we get this out of our water? All right. And that's a good question. I understand where that question comes from, but until we turn off the tap. We can't talk about cleaning up, right? Because we can try and pull it out of our water, but it's literally, it's an exponential increase in plastics production. More is flowing into our water every day. And so if you just think about cleaning it up, that's not going to solve the problem. The only way to really solve the problem is to turn off the tap. Um, so I really want you to think about the fact that our use of plastic is ultimately the problem, right? This material is there because of us, because of that disposable lifestyle that we've all bought into, you know, me included, um, not trying to point my fingers at anybody in the room, right? We are the problem, and I know that that is really depressing and nobody wants to accept that, but I want you to think of it the different way. That means that we're also the solution, right? So this can be really empowering to realize that every piece of plastic that I find in the external environment is ultimately up to us. We can control what we find out there by simply refusing our use of single-use disposable plastics because they make up the vast majority, 65% of the market, are these things that we throw out. We use for minutes, but they are here forever. Um, and so as you refuse them, you really can be the change that you wish to see in the world. And with that, I'll take questions. Down. Ah. <laughs> so I feel like you're my sister from my own mother. Honestly, I can I can cry right now. I'm just so pumped. But um, I've been confessing, this is not gonna be politically correct, I'm sorry about that. That the use of plastics affecting the endocrine system is so pervasive. Over the past ten years we have had an increase of of children not knowing their gender. And I know it affects the testes and the ovaries and the pituitary gland, and I know it's affecting a lot of things that people are not willing to look at, 
we have had an explosion. And my theory, and you confirmed almost everything I've been confessing for the past four years, people think I'm nuts. And I don't give a damn at this point yeah. because it is so pervasive. You might not want to be my friend. <laughs> no, it's a complicated, I know where you're going with this, and it is extremely complicated and not one that people want to touch on. So um, and filling our babies, our children, yeah. with, with medication for attention deficit and ADD and all these other things that we can't solve. Mm -hmm. And I'm left to teach them, and I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with children who struggle with who they think they are, their gender, and I'm, I'm not judging them. I'm right, not. yeah. But I have, in my 30 years of teaching, have never seen such an increase of this kind of confusion. Not to mention disabilities. Mm -hmm. Kids with, with dial, di um, diabetic pumps mm -hmm. and so many other things that these children are dealing with. How can we not look at this as a realistic cause, causation, for these physical numbers? No, I mean, and there's lots of, um, do you know Theo Colburn? No. Our Stolen Future is a book that you should definitely read. It's, it's, um, it was written, I think, in 97. Um, she's really kind of, um, you know, like the, almost like the child of, of uh, um, oh goodness, uh, uh, Silent Spring. It's kind of like the next one in that series. And then Living Downstream is a, is a more recent, that's Sarah Stangraber, um, Sandra Stangraber Graber, um, from Cornell. Um, and they all talk about the same thing. All three of those books, they're just um, different periods of time. Living Downstream is more recent, but I thought Our Stolen Future, um, Theo Colborn, um, really kind of laid it out. And it's all about the endocrine disrupting chemicals and how when we're exposed, it's, it sounds like such a, a plethora of, of, of diseases, right? You're like everything from cancer to autism to obesity. What the heck? But it depends upon... Um, you know, uh, how susceptible somebody is when you're exposed, right? From the moment a child is born, they're already exposed to, I mean, this is just one study and more need to be done, but on average, 300 different synthetic chemicals are in their blood when they're born. 300 that they've been exposed to while they've been growing in vitro. Right? And so you think about how that's literally affecting how it's reprogramming the very beginnings of, of who we are. Uh, it's, you know, it really is quite staggering. And so, yeah, I think there, I mean, there's, there's definitely connections there. And, um, and I think it's something that, I mean, look, you know, the United Nations puts plastic pollution second only to climate change in terms of the ability of our species to survive on this planet. Right? And this is one of the reasons. Right? Yeah, she's got the microphone there for you. Um, in your tap water study, yeah. were you able to, to separate out tap water that came through a public treatment system as opposed to tap water that came through um, classical um, wells? Well, yeah, that's a really great question, and it's one that we were hoping to, to be able to tease out. Um, but people, so they sent us their water, and then they filled out a survey. And the problem is, is that some people don't really know where their water comes from. And so we weren't able to really do that. So it's, 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 a, it's primed follow-up study that needs to be done that I've been asked about many times and um, it's just a matter of finding funding but I know a lot of people are thinking about that what's the difference and so I think that would be a really interesting um, interesting question so we don't really know the answer to that. Uh, in the early 90s I attended a um, IJC biennial and it was the first time I heard about endocrine disruptors and when I heard about the idea that it was going to affect men's sperm count and back then it was always men that were at the top of the various uh, com uh, companies, etc. I thought, oh, good, they'll say my sperm count's going down, so I've got to do something about this. Right. And they still have it. No. We still have it. Right. So, I mean, I, I'm getting to the point I'm starting to get uh, cynical about us as a species because right. we can't. We bury our heads in the sand. Yeah, it's. And over 30 years, haven't made a decision to do something about it. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be really depressing. I mean, I, I have to say, um, 
One, yeah, that, I mean, it, I think part of the problem, right, is that it, it's intergenerational, right? So, like, oh, well, whatever happens to my kid, right? You don't see the effects. It's, it's the frog in the boiling water. Um, but it, with regard to this issue, I mean, the one thing I can say is that, I mean, our, our data came out, and within two years, the Microbees Free Water Act was passed, um, and it's happening internationally. And you see a lot of movement on this happening like I'm on a United Nations working group right now, right? So this is happening across the planet um, and you see a lot of activism around this. So I think that is really an encouraging sign. And from all sorts of spectrums, from activists to actually industry, um, you know, in their conferences, they will have sections on talking about what do we do about this? Now, they're still increasing production of synthetic plastics while they figure it out, which is very frustrating, right? But they are very much aware of the problem. And so that that's at least, at least they're not ignoring it the way that they did like cigarettes, right? I mean, at least they're, they're out there talking about it and, and, and trying to do, try, do you know, um, engaging in research um, and looking for other options. So, I mean, that's, that's, the best thing I can say, you know, and, and that ultimately, I mean, what make, what I think the big thing with the Microbeads Free Water Act, the reason it passed um, is because people were so outspoken. And I think we tend to think that, like, government is this, you know, Goliath and we're David and we can't fight them. But um, when we speak all together very loudly, they do actually respond to that. And so you start, you know, shipping your plastic back to companies <laughs> so that they, like, you know, are like, I don't want your plastic. You know, we start doing these crazy things, they start responding to that. And so I think, you know, I think we really what we need to do is kind of really feel empowered. You know, this, this is something that really we can tackle. Um, I think other issues... I, don't, I was looking at the eels and I'm just like, oh my gosh, like I don't even know, kind of sometimes you just don't even know where to start with the problem, but this is something that because we are the ones who buy the plastic, we are the ones who use the plastic, right, this is something that we can take really charge of. I don't want a straw. I don't want a plastic bag. I don't want it, <laughs> you know, and finding ways to eliminate it in all sorts of different ways. Like I buy Bits toothpaste now, which are, is little tablets of toothpaste that comes in a glass bottle. So I no longer buy tubes of toothpaste. Right? I carry my metal straws with me. I carry my bamboo utensils with me. And we start doing these things and it can really add up. He's got the microphone. <laughs> Oh, you're totally fine. Thank you. That's in with that same study that we've talked to, to various, um, actually, vendors of filters about doing. Um, you, if you want to know my, my gut reaction, I don't know if you want to know it, but if you want to know my gut reaction, and this is based upon our wastewater treatment plant where we did studies of um, before and after mixed media filter, which is basically what a brutal filter is, we found no difference in the amount of plastic. And my thinking is that probably when you first get the filter and you hook it up, that probably some plastic is getting caught. And then the more water you filter through it, it just slowly gets pushed out. Yeah, so that's my... Uh, thanks for coming back again. Uh, two things. One, mylar balloons. They're all over the world. They're in the water. Balloons blow. In the water column. Do they photo degrade like polymer plastics or not? Yeah, no, they, they get they get brittle and then they slowly break apart as well. So, I mean. It's not a photo degradation moment or is it a, it, a mechanical? Uh, it's, well, yeah, so photo degradation is basically a mechanical it's 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 not a chemical degradation it's a mechanical so they break into smaller and smaller pieces 
um, but they're maintaining their integrity, kind of on a chemical, on a microscopic level. And, and another thing out of, a, of personal interest, uh, it was interesting in the beginning how you told how you got into this. You might be interested to know that 45 years ago, I found myself in the, at the bottom of the world in Antarctica doing research. And 45 years ago, I found the styrofoam beads in the water column in Antarctica when we did the nucleotones. I was very upset at the time. I brought it to the attention of the scientists. I was not a uh, scientist, I was a captain on the ship. Right. And the scientists were interested in, the, in their the cephalopods and all. <laughs> they the were biologists. They had blinders on. They were yeah. like they're fish. Yeah. Okay. So I took this observation of mine back to the States. I got back nine months later, and I went to the Dr. Paul Fai, the director of the Woods Hole Ocean Better Research Institution, who was also on the International Policy uh, Conference and all, and I presented it to him. But it fell in deaf ears because I was not a scientist. I was a member of the ship's crew. Right. And uh, I, I think about that a lot. Yeah. Thanks so much for your work. It's, it's, it's late in coming, but we're grateful for your work. Thank you. Thank you. One more? Okay. Hi, Sherry. Um, first of all, I think your work is amazing and your initiative is, is very exemplary. Thank you. I am curious as to the um, concentrations of particles based on the sources of waters being um, within upper watersheds versus lower watersheds. So if you were to look at water from the Adirondacks or from springs in Vermont and compare it to waters from um, Lake Ontario or the St. Lawrence River, are the concentrations significantly uh, lower for the upper watersheds than for the lower Right, that's a great question. And one of the studies that I skipped over was our 29 tributary studies. So we, we looked at 29 tributaries to the Great Lakes. They represent 20% of the water coming into the Great Lakes. It was across, you know, we had tributaries going into each of the five Great Lakes. So, you know, um, and, and so, and they, they covered different from very rural environments to very urban. Um, and, and not, you know, surprisingly, I guess, is that it, um, uh, you find more plastic in urban runoff versus rural and during high flow versus low flow, right? So high urban had the most plastic, low flow urban had next, and then high flow rural and then, high, and then low flow rural, right? You would see this kind of diminishing um, amount of plastic um, with the exception of fibers. Did not matter, fibers were always high. So I think the main pathway um, and I didn't have a chance to talk about this, but I think the main pathway that the, the fibers, which is what we saw mostly in the tap water, I think the main pathway for fibers is coming through the air. The bottled water, that is not true. What we found in bottled water was mostly fragments, and we were able to actually do FTIR analysis showing that it was coming from the cap and from the bottle. So the actual act of opening the bottle of water may be contributing most of the plastic to the water that you then drink. Um, because that was where most of the plastic was. It was the cap as polypropylene. So, um, yeah, so fiber is very different. <laughs> and I, I know there's more questions. I'll stick around. <laughs> Talk to me. <laughs> so, Sam, thank you very much. And she will be around afterwards. And I'm as you know, she likes to answer questions. Uh, we we're just fortunate to have her here. And I apologize for running over, but I knew everybody was interested and had a lot of questions.